Well, hello and welcome to the special edition of the Dividend Cafe. This is our investment committee doing a special podcast edition here on Monday, February 24th in light of market action today. We woke up this morning to uh, futures down over 700 points. At one point, they were down about 1,000. Market opened down roughly 900 points and then came back to only down about 730 or so. And as we're sitting here recording mid-market day exactly at the halfway point, we've now reached our low of the day. We're down a little over 1,000 points on the Dow, over 100 points on the S&P. It's 3.5% of a downturn in one day on the Dow and the S&P um, and uh, 4% on the NASDAQ. So, um, obviously, uh, a bit to chew on here, and we want to give you our best thoughts as to what we're doing and what we're not doing and what we're recommending and thinking. And, um, obviously, upon you listening to the podcast or watching the video, reading some of the commentary that we're sending out, we welcome any additional questions. And for those of you that are clients of the Bonson Group, um, I do hope you will be uh, in communication with your private wealth advisor on any particular questions you may have for yourself, although I I would imagine when you hear our perspective on things that will cover a lot of what may be on your mind, but to the extent you want uh, something more than just our investment committee here speaking to you, please do reach out and and, uh, we'll have plenty more to say. Um, I I will, uh, first of all, uh, Brian Satel is not with us today, but we have Robert Graham, Dea Parnas, and Julian Fazzo to my right, and um, we're going to not really cover this... um, uh, I'm not going to ask anyone today when coronavirus is getting better. Can we stipulate from, from the top that you guys don't know? Do any of you know something I don't know? <laughs> I think I know we need to change. Apparently, now it's called COVID-19 for some reason. Okay. <laughs> That's yeah, the, the change the name. Nomenclature, I guess. And nobody yeah. still knows when. Yeah, yeah. I'm not going to do that. Yeah, <laughs> yeah but we do not have some sort of crystal ball to let you know exactly no. when this uh when this will be contained, no. I think um, that then beyond us starting off by saying we don't know when the virus itself will be contained, that would behoove the listeners to hear us also point out the probably more significant fact, which is that neither does anybody else. And any attempt to say that one knows how exactly it will end is dishonest. Uh, perhaps um, those who would have an overly bold view of of how it's going to end and when it's going to end and what it's going to look like and so forth. Perhaps they have an agenda. Perhaps they do not. Perhaps they're just an arrogant and naive person. More likely, they may have a particular agenda, either a real bullish view um, or a real bearish view or something like that. That's okay. Uh, if it wasn't this, it would be something else that would be kind of provoking it. But, I mean, I think on the medical aspect and the global uh, pandemic fears, it, it's important to start off with that idea of just not n- knowing exactly how one may may twist it. So that allows us to get into what we're going to spend our time here doing. What I've been really kind of focusing on since about three o'clock in the morning Pacific time today, which is the reiteration of the concept of asset allocation and the uh, market perspective historically, and and particularly where we are now, we had a client that that you know would email this morning, mm-hmm. uh, some concerns about about where market has from all this, and you know I all I simply said was yeah we're back at you know New Year's Eve numbers. <laughs> How are you feeling on New Year's Eve? And and they wrote back laughing like oh I was feeling great on New Year's Eve. And so mm-hmm. so I don't I don't think it takes away from the fact you're down a thousand points today and market's given up some gains it had in mm-hmm. January, and then what happened is we given them away. A few weeks ago, did you guys remember that? Does that all sound familiar? And then we got them back, and so it's kind of the second yep. time of give and take. But any, anyways, I guess that's why I want to tee it up to you guys and let us uh, share with our listeners the best wisdom we have to offer. Um, down three uh, percent. It's happened like over a thousand times, and and um, yet there is an uncertainty as to how far this could go, where it would go, a few incidents in North North Italy that people don't seem to have a lot of clarity as to exactly where this came from. No one is daring to pretend that there's like an actual specific economic agenda t- attached to the Italy. Uh, it's more just the kind of like, oh, well, if it's in Italy, it could be somewhere else and so forth. Here in Orange County, California, where we're sitting right now at our Newport Beach headquarters, 
There is a movement to put about 50 quarantine people in Costa Mesa, California, which is next door. And and uh, we have people that are involved uh, that are going to court this afternoon trying to fight that. People that I've been talking to over the weekend. So there's, you know, questions logistically about what they're going to be doing with things. But, Robert, let me start with you and we'll go around the circle um, because there's a whole lot of, of connected events and maybe not as connected as we may think, but relevant to everything going on around interest rates, treasury yields, what the Fed now may be more likely to do as opposed to before, all of these things. But just as it pertains to the broader subject of how investors respond to uh, highly volatile downside events, what are your thoughts this morning? I, you know, I'm, I'm thinking that there's a lot of folks that are, you know, grateful to have some uh, fixed income exposure in their portfolios, that asset allocation that you were just talking about. You know, it's after a you know, rally mode year like last year, people start to get a little, uh, you know, dare I say euphoric and say, hey, why would I want to touch any of this kind of stuff? Rates are at, you know, XYZ percent. How much lower can they go? And we're sitting today and I think the 10 years, you know, floating around one, one, three, six or so, right? So, I mean, that's... It's it's kind of kind of strange to me, but again, if we were doing our jobs, if we were telling people, hey, if you can't take the volatility, which is inevitable in equities over the long term, have, have some bonds if you need that. You know, pe- people are probably smiling today a little bit. So, so I guess it's a, a really good question. If the whole point of asset allocation is for the various volatility uh, things that can come up as equity investors. So like you look at multiple asset classes and you go, well, stocks have the best long-term return. I'm a long-term investor. So you start with the premise that you probably would therefore want all stocks, except for what? Volatility. That's right. Mm-hmm. Controlling those things that go wrong along the way and the drawdowns. Yeah. So that is the whole point. I guess this is my question. Is the point of it for 3% drops or for 7, 9, 15, even, God forbid, 20%? Drops? It depends on the person, right? And that's that's why you weigh how much you have in something like fixed income versus the equities because there's there's different risk tolerances out there. So there's folks out there who say, hey, I, I can't take the uh, you know the up and down 79, 10% in equities as a single asset class. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to float that with a little bit of fixed income exposure. Yeah. So that's why there's, there's no cookie cutter approach to, to how much it is or, or what it's for. Everyone's different. They need more or less fixed income accordingly. But Dad, do you think that for the investor that says, I can sleep at night if my total portfolio draws down 15%, mm. and let's say in that case, that person might have 50 to 60% of their portfolio in equities, and then equities drop 3% are, are from the highs, you know, because we were down last week too, so let's say 4 or 5%, and then the bonds are up, alternatives are up, so maybe their whole portfolio is down 3 mm-hmm. And do you think that that it should be different when the cause of the equity drawdown is coronavirus or the cause of the drawdown is known. It seems to me that people have a higher risk tolerance in the abstract. The, the just generic drawdown of 10 to 20 to 30 percent is fine. But once it gets attached to a headline, then it has a certain different fear dimension. Yeah, and I think specifically a headline that we're seeing today, I think it's uh, awful scary. It's very easy to let your imagination run away with you and just completely forget the historical precedent and say, oh my God, this contagion is going to take all over the world and all, all the supply chains will be destroyed and who knows when containment will ever happen. So I think uh, that type of uncertainty uh, can lead to that kind of fear and somebody not really being rational about their risk tolerance. As far as this this drawdown, look, we haven't seen a move like today in quite some time. I think the volatility has been so compressed. Well, it's been uh, five and a half months since uh, since August or so. Yeah. So yeah, it's been quite so. So I, I can understand. No, no, I'm actually I'm actually asking not to argue yeah. or be sarcastic. Yeah. I'm curious. When you said quite some time, did you mean five and a half months or did you think it no, no, been longer? I, no, I I, I I do remember seeing it somewhere in August. Uh, we were okay, so you're considering five and a half months quite some time. Right. Uh, well, yeah, it's been a, it's been a quite a minute. Dan's younger than I am. <laughs> quite quite a minute <laughs> since, since we've seen a daily move of this magnitude. Got it. Okay. Um, but uh, but as far as fundamentals being affected, I saw I saw Warren Buffett on CNBC today and he was talking about, look, uh, you know. Based on this short term, what happened today, do, do you think the prospects for American businesses have changed in the next 10 to 20 years? And I don't think anybody can seriously answer that they have. So, yeah, there's uh, been some uh, deterioration on the fundamental side. China most likely won't see any growth this quarter. Uh, but have prospects fundamentally changed? If you are a long term investor, uh, 
we we maintain they haven't. So so all in all, it's a, we consider it a buying opportunity. Well, Julian, I'm going to maybe even do one better than Dea. If we believed that 1,000 points ago in the Dow, there were a bunch of companies that offered a great forward return context around their cash flow growth, their earnings growth, and the dividends they pay back to us, and now the those those same growth scenarios and expectations are 1,000 points cheaper, don't we like it better? Yeah, I mean, that that's really, that, that's how you should look at it. Uh, this is a bad day for people we need we need to raise cash and we need to sell equities. But if you if you buy off equity for the long term, this is actually a good day. Mm-hmm. And um, so, if you had your your savings account and now you need uh, some, and it was all in the stock market, and you needed to withdraw from your savings today, this would be a bad day. Yeah, it would be, be a bad day. That. I mean, you could have, uh, you know, you would have had three percent uh, extra uh, if you withdrew on Friday. But you know, um, uh, that's the exception. I guess we, um, you know, um, for so the- maybe that is something that needs to be said. Mm-hmm. When you're getting ready to make that down payment on your house, when you're getting ready to go buy a boat, when you might have an emergency rainy day yeah, need, yeah. go ahead and don't put that in the stock market. Mm-hmm. When well, I guess, and that's what do you the, think? Absolutely, and and make sure you have some type of cash flow component <laughs> yeah, from your holdings. Great, great advice. Yeah, <laughs> and yeah. there's the whole idea of uh, right. uh, capital allocation, and you know, right. and and it's really uh, as you say, based on your, I guess, you know, your age, and uh, like mm-hmm. if you can be invested for the next thirty years, you should. Mostly be in equities, but if you are like gonna need that cash tomorrow, you probably shouldn't have too much equities, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. So I think that's really um, at the end of the day, that's that's what we're trying to do for investors on a case by case basis. So, to, so Buffett said something else this morning on on CNBC. I, was, I thought it was interesting. Um, in addition to the kind of obvious thing, we're reiterating that things. Uh, where their long-term fundamentals have not deteriorated from from headline events, as significant and real as headline events are. And that's the thing that's really important for me to point out, is for those that are headline investors, that invest around the headlines or fear of headlines, um, they put themselves on a hamster wheel of bad timing. You know, you could argue that, unless there was someone like predicted <laughs> coronavirus, that's... I mean, that's kind of a weird. <laughs> I, I don't know. I don't. I haven't heard anyone say that. I'm sure there'll be people claiming that. I'm sure there will be. Call them investors. No, you should call them traders because they're investing. Well, that's, yes. Yeah, but I don't even think there's traders that were predicting coronavirus. It, all I know is that someone could say, uh, "Oh, I would. I could have gotten out, and then I can get back in." And, so, and you know, that's just it's so insane. Mm-hmm. And by the way, that's not just like the entry of coronavirus and the exit of coronavirus. Those two things would be ridiculously impossible to time. But within it, you already had, at the end of January, a 1,000-point drop. At the beginning of February, a 1,000-point increase. So, so yeah, now today and one day we've had a 1,000. But my point being, we've gone like three or four times just in the last four or five weeks. This is very much in line with our call that we've, we've been talking about for the last several podcasts about the enhanced volatility to this resolution. But my point being, take coronavirus out. Could we not imagine... I'm not kidding. Ten other things that could cause us to be sitting here right now saying, hey, the market's down a thousand today. What are we doing? What do we think? What do we like more? What are, you know, This is coronavirus related. Mm-hmm. Um, but my point being, could it not be an unexpected announcement from Japan or, or a panicking thing in China mm-hmm. or a geopolitical flare up in Saudi Arabia? You know, the, 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 we don't need to be very imaginative. This stuff happens. It right now it happens to be coronavirus. So you're yeah. saying the, the market's you, market wants an excuse to come off all time highs, pretty much, and the coronavirus is a pretty. Oh, I don't know if it's an excuse. I know what you're saying though, yeah. but I guess what I mean is more that um, the headlines have things permanently. And Always. You could, you could yeah. have four months. You got six months. You could have a, like a year. I don't think so, but you could have a long period of time with no real disruptive event. Mm-hmm. But but I, okay, right now today we're down three and a half percent. In the entire year of 2017, the market never went down 2.9% or more. The largest drawdown for the whole year was a 2.8, 2.9%. So, so um, you do have little periods of very low volatility, but that was literally the lowest volatility year in market history. I'm only trying to make the point that 3 to 4% drawdowns this one could, is from coronavirus. The next one will be from something different, but there will be a next mm-hmm. one. And and investor response to me ought to be the same in this one as the last 56 of them <laughs> and the next one. And that's what I was about to say Buffett said is he said he thinks 
that in his 80 years or whatever that there's been, you know, a thousand three percent drops. And he said, I can't think of one of them that I wish I hadn't been buying more stocks. Right. right. You know, here, here we yeah. are. Um, but anyways, okay, yeah. let, let's clear one thing off the table real quick because I got a note this morning from someone and they're going to ask me to comment on it on, on Fox in a little bit that is some of this related to Bernie Sanders having won the Nevada caucus so hands down mm -hmm. over the weekend. And I'm going to stick to the contrarian view. I offered up a couple podcasts ago that that doesn't make sense. Hmm. Trump's odds of winning the general have gone higher as Bernie's odds of winning the Democratic primary have gone higher. Bernie's now at a 65% betting odds of winning the Democratic nomination. Trump is up to 56% odds of winning the general election. Those two things have been inverse real related. Now, by the way, I think the 56% for Trump is too high. And I think the 65% for Bernie winning the nomination is too low. Mm. But my point being, do we think the market is responding in February to an event that actually makes the general election going the Republicans' way and maybe even the House and very likely the Senate coming the other way towards pro-market, yeah. pro-Trump? Yeah, I was just going to ask what you thought about the down ballot effects of it, because I think you're absolutely right. With I think it strengthens Trump's case. But, mm -hmm. I mean, does it help those kind of in limbo types of uh, Senate candidates? I think, I think if you have some sort of generic... Democrat moderate. I hate using the word because I don't really think any of these guys are moderate, but let's pretend you had Bloomberg or Biden. Mm -hmm. I think that Trump has a 50.01% chance of beating them, but I think the House would be about 85% likely to stay Democrat. Okay. With Bernie as the nominee, the House is 50 50. Mm -hmm. Okay. The Senate is extremely likely to stay Republican, mm -hmm. probably is in any scenario. Mm. But but yeah, if anything, I think you're looking at a better odds of even the House going back Republican. Not sure thing though. It's tough to win yeah, twenty yeah, some seats. I think so yeah, like like you said, uh, as far as if you're trying to attribute the down move in the market today to Bernie, the likelihood of Bernie uh, clinching the nomination is is higher. I totally agree. I I don't think that makes sense at all because if rationally, if you look at it, the odds of Trump getting elected have increased because you know those things are inversely related. So without any sort of coronavirus headline, we might, all in all likelihood, see an uptick in the market. So, and what uh, is that? What is the sector that you would think Bernie would be the biggest threat to? It would be healthcare, right? It, yeah, health, the, healthcare. The healthcare sector yeah. is yeah. down today, but it's okay. outperforming okay. all other sectors. Right there, you go. That's another great example. Example why. That's, that's why they not, pay uh, me the big bucks. <laughs> <laughs> I guess energy is telling you that it's the coronavirus. Yeah, I think yeah, this yeah. week clearly yeah. the reason for the sell-off and yeah. Not, yeah. not the election. I think I uh, here's what I would guess, and I say this all the time, and I really mean it. And I think we have to believe this cohesively as an investment committee, and I think we do. The the it's impossible to always state with certainty what percentage of movement can be attributed to what. But this one's an easy one. It's primarily coronavirus fears. But then you do get an add-on effect. Like like if there was sort of a divine market movement, which there isn't, what would what's the right amount that would be attributed to coronavirus today? Let's and we're down a thousand. I would say it might be six hundred points with then 300 points of computers and algorithms and momentum okay, accelerating yeah. it because I, you do see an awful lot I can't say the names right now but of the four or five largest companies S&P 500 they're getting pummeled yeah. and some of them have less coronavirus exposure than others and yet there it seems to be indiscriminate and I think that's index fund selling yeah selling yeah. begets selling yeah. uh, because right. of algorithms or fear or, but the instigator behind that selling I think we all agree is is the coronavirus. But I guess yeah. the question is, uh, at what point does it become self fulfilling? What's happening with coronavirus? Because now you're starting to you see the inversion, you know, in the yeah. year, year. But I don't I don't think you started to see the inversion of the yield curve. The, it with started this? earlier, but oh, yeah. weeks getting, earlier. Yeah. But it's getting uh, steeper, and and now we, st you know, t yeah. you hear again people talking about. Uh, you know, are we going to have a deflation again? Or, you know, I would, you know, have gross Yeah, I mean, if, if someone says, are we going to have deflation again? <laughs> then I think they need to lose their license to practice economics. Because, of course, we know, what do you mean again? Where did defla has deflation gone away all of a sudden? These deflate, did, when, when did the tenure, when it hit its low of last summer, let's call it 150. I think it hit 146 for a minute, but let's call it mm -hmm. 150. Where did it rally back up to? 190? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Was yeah. so 190 a non-deflationary 10-year yield? 
Yeah. Right? I mean, yeah, so yeah. E- that, that, that deflationary backdrop to the U.S., but especially global economics, has been embedded in interest rates. It's heightened in the last couple of weeks. Um, and then you get the technical factor of flight to safety. I'm still amused when people talk about gold. I know what they mean. The fear trade has a sort of vernacular. And gold got above 1700 an ounce today. And they go, people flying to the safety of gold mm-hmm. and flying to the safety of the 10-year. Treasuries always receive that quote-unquote safety, but it's sort of mysterious why something that has a beta uh, and has a vol of gold and is considered a safety trade, you know, like the safety of have, have having a negative compounding for seven years now. Yeah. You're underwater for seven years, mm-hmm. and that's safety. I don't understand it. I, yeah, I don't understand it either. And the correlation obviously is very, very weak behind yeah. uh, behind inflate, you know, inflation and the price appreciation of gold. And very weak. I, I know, I know, we've talked about that quite extensively. But do you think, Julian, that that the interest rate signal? is um, something that we should be discussing even apart from the coronavirus sort of piling onto it. The reality is you do have a 10-year right now that may very well close today at an all-time low. It's it's flirting with it now in the high 130s. And uh, I believe the 90-day is sitting there at mm-hmm. 155. So you're going to be 18 basis points inverted, 90-day yep. to 10-year. Um See, to me, this is where it, if someone wants to be bullish, they should try to blame it on coronavirus because that is, a, that, that is again, reflecting something else in the long-term views of the economy that is very deflationary and not good. Yeah, no, no, no um, I agree. I guess it's um, it's interesting to see how the implied probabilities of cuts have moved so much in yeah. the in the last few days. Uh, and now we're talking. You know, we have a few meetings. The March 18 meetings, which is the next one, uh, we're still expecting you know no cuts. But it went from you know five percent probability to 25 percent uh, in a few days. But if you go to June, you get to only. 25% chance of zero cuts. So the market already has a 75% implied probability of cuts coming by the summer. And then you go to but December. But do you, where do you have it on June as of this morning on the Fed futures? Um, uh, I have tw- uh, 25% chance of zero cut. And then I have... Uh, oh, so, so 75 s- chance of a cut in of June. A, a cut, oh, at oh. least a cut, one cut. Yeah, yeah. see, so that, that means by something. June. The March thing means nothing. Okay, twenty five percent chance in March of a cut. Oh, yeah, no, for sure. Yeah, it is the same thing as a ninety yeah. percent chance of no cut because the twenty five are just people fording with yeah. a very mm-hmm. leveraged um, option trade. You have to get to the 60s, 70s, eighties to where it's actually the market expecting it. Exactly. So, so a June a chance of a rate cut. Um, and by December, you have a market that says 5% chance of zero cuts. So clearly very much saying there will be cuts and yeah. there'll be one, two or three cuts by the end of the at, year. At least one. So that's, uh, you know, that's, and that's quite a big move. And two weeks ago, we were already assuming some but cuts by the I'm end having of the year. a hard time knowing what to do with that. Okay. Because there's nothing in that that's telling me the market is now saying because of coronavirus, the Fed's about to cut. They're basically saying they're not going to cut in March, and the odds on a June cut, I don't know, that's four months out. It's not meaningfully higher. It's almost, that's sort of divorced from coronavirus. I guess they're saying that they, they, it's the coronavirus is going to impact Q1 earnings. It's going to impact um, um, inflation expectations in the short term, and that's going to be enough to justify uh, another um you know, the cuts by probably the summer. I you consider that saying. bullish or bearish? As, as far as... Uh, if market, the Fed were to cut rates again in the summertime. I mean, I, I it's for the market yeah. manipulation, but as far as if you're a, a, an investor, you, you know, I think it's uh, it's bullish as far as market appreciation goes. Robert? Yeah, I think it's going to be just a little bit more of the uh, the punch to the party. I don't, you know, the Julian's right. I mean, if they're, if they're getting hard data and they act on it, that's one thing. But, I, you know, I worry with, not as much our our Fed, but around the world, when there's talk of things that are not directly related to mon- monetary policy, they're talking mm-hmm. about climate change, they're talking about coronavirus. That's not, generally speaking, the mandate. Like I, I, I prefer they act on the real data. But to your point, if it, if the data comes in and necessitates a cut, they're going to do it, and we'll have well, a little rally mode. Yeah. I think. I, I view it um, as potentially bullish in summer 2020. I'm not even sure of that, but I see it as really bearish for 2022, 2023. 
and I, I can't speak for everybody who's listening right now. I would hope those people listening intend to be investors in two or three years. But I know I speak for me and I speak for my partners here at this table. I intend to be managing money in two or three years. I'm not looking forward to them having to unwind whatever additional booze they put in the punch bowl mm, yeah, now. Sure. At, at, and the pushing the string effect, how stimulative is it at a two and a half or three percent Fed funds to come to one and a half? It's a certain amount of stimulus. It's, it is what it mm. is. Relatively speaking, what is the stimulative effect of going from one and a half to 125? <laughs> I would argue it's almost nil. And if anything, they're just dinking around with investor sentiment and psychology. Yeah, I mean, uh, clearly, I wish they would stay out of the whole thing. I mean, who knows what kind of, what they're incentivizing by keeping the cost of money this low? And then, I mean, uh, how do they expect... It's stock market. It's pure and it's simple like pure, stock market. Pure, I mean, yeah, the whole thing is very, very distortive, and I agree. Uh, what kind of nefarious uh, eff effects or risks are building up because of the distortion of monetary policy, but... You know, uh, unfortunately, this this is the Fed we got. <laughs> They're like the Fed has lost control of the monetary policy, and it's really the market that decides now for the Fed and uh, yeah. and yeah, sets expectation, right. and they never go against the market. So the market is asking for a few cuts, and they're gonna deliver on them. Yeah, the problem from a credibility standpoint that I don't, uh, I not only agree with you, but I think that's been true forever, forever. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's the the implied take away from the entire reign of Alan Greenspan. And so here's the thing. The market, the Fed can never admit that. And I think it would be very undermining to financial credibility. But at the end of the day, if that's really what we have, um, once that awareness is fully baked in, then I don't think it has any efficacy either. Um, at, at the end of the day, the, the, they can go manipulate that short-term rate lower but they clearly have lost any ability to control the longer term rate. And what they would have to do is come out and say uh, QE needs to become a, non, a permanent fixture of American monetary policy as a non-emergency measure. Mm. That in order for us to maintain some curve, some, some steepness in the yield curve, we will have to be at ZERP and as uh, manipulators of the longer part of the curve through uh, bond buying transactions wow. for, till kingdom comes. That's scary. It's scary because it sounds yeah. almost likely, yeah. that, you know, in, in a non-emergency situation that there would be that type of QE to, get to manipulate the long end of the curve. I, I don't know what to say. <laughs> Julian, where's the, 60, where's the 60 billion a month of bond buying T-bills now? Why is the 90 day at 164? Well, I guess because uh, QE4 that, you know, they don't want to call QE4 is uh, is ongoing. and uh, as but, far as but, I mean, isn't that supposed to bring down the, the ultra short-term rate? Um, um, well, I guess it should, but it's, uh, you know, it's... Uh, yeah, it's not really working. Uh, I think <laughs> I think it's not working, but I, I, guess, I guess I'm wondering, are they doing it? Are they doing it? I think it. I think there could be a technical issue, a, uh, it's a patterns. There, there's something that seems to be throwing off that movement of rates in the short term because sixty billion is plenty enough to pull that short term rate down. Um, okay, so we 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 don't we, the Bernie theory. We're not into if we don't like the idea that Nevada has caused a thousand points today. Um, the the bond market is cause and effect. Of things going on right now, Fed issues, Fed questions. Julian's wisely pointed out that the Fed futures market is now asking the Fed for additional cuts, but they don't seem to be doing it here into the short term. They're pushing that out a little bit to later in the year. Um, okay, so mm. the 10 year right now, it's forwarding with the all time low. A little trivia for you. It's okay if you all get it wrong. 137 is the magic number. When's the last time the 10 year was at 137? 2013. Was it? Yeah. Incorrect, but oh. close. Brexit. Oh, okay. Okay. Yeah. Brexit went down 1,000 points three days. Mm. Where was the market a week later? <laughs> plus 10, <laughs> yeah. plus 5, something R like that. Rallied pretty much in the middle. Yeah. And the yeah. 10 year was back to 175. Yeah. Mm. yeah. So. Is that to say it will play out exactly the same way again? No. One thing I thought was interesting, and your screen will show you the VIX is up 40% today, but there's actually something really odd about that. 
because it was only at 16 or 17. Mm. So it's such a low denominator that now sitting here with a VIX at 26. Um, I got to be honest, 26 isn't that high of a VIX. Yeah, I mean, still, low. still very low relative to other alleged, you know, extreme fear spikes. Mm. Mm. Uh, so, Robert, actionably speaking, um, what should we be thinking about uh, with our equity portfolios right now? Do we look to buy? Do we look to nibble? Do we just sit on our hands? Or or do we even uh, throw in the towel, say we want to sell and get out of the way a little bit? No, I think I think as as the volatility increases, it's going to continue to you know lift that fog and show us the water where the opportunities are, I think. Um, I'm, I'm keeping an eye on emerging markets, uh, even so. Um, you know, with strong dollar, it has been kind of a, a persistent theme this year, contrary to what a lot of uh, people thought might happen coming mm -hmm. into this year. And, you know, you can talk about the supply chain disruptions, et cetera, et cetera, you know, possibility of, of lower rates here all, all being factors with EM. But I think more even than Friday, EM is becoming a, a good buy if you're selective about where you're going. So looking to add to EM, yeah. um, Dale, what about within the U.S. equity uh, positioning, we see energy's down, oil's down about 5% today. It's not a big deal there. Um, but do we uh, just kind of look to fill in things to get lower? Yeah, clearly the uh, some sectors have more value than others. I think that for, and we did this this morning, for clients that have some cash sitting on the sidelines waiting mm -hmm. to be put to work, we, uh, we took advantage of today's down move. Uh, so uh, we're, we're not we're not really uh, you know buying a singular stock or focusing on adding a lot to a certain sector, but clients that have cash on the sideline. We've been putting that to work today, so that's that's where we're at. Well, um, behaviorally, I think that it would behoove us to offer that reminder. Um, you will be surprised. I, you can't say pleasantly surprised. If your bonds pull your portfolio up two three percent and your equities pull it down four or five, so you're net net down. You know, that that's um, something people deal with, think about. It doesn't bother me because I'm a pretty experienced investor, and it's my job to not be bothered by things like that. I've seen this movie many, many times. However, to the extent that one is always wondering why they have bonds or other such volatility reducers in the portfolio, I think that a week like last week, daylight today, uh, people are going to very likely, we still have a few days to go in February, they're very likely going to get a statement that shows their bonds way up on the month and their stocks way down or, or at least modestly down. And that is, of course, the intention of, of offsetting that volatility, as Robert said earlier in our podcast. Um, but can I bring up something different? You guys can push back on me on this if you want. I, I want to go back to something we talked about in our themes for 2020, which was get me some illiquidity. I'm thinking about where private credit, some of the real estate positions, some of the hedge funds uh, set their marks, the timing that goes along with it. Uh, flying back from New York last night, I watched The Big Short on the plane, and it's a real kind of a heretical movie of historical revisionism about the financial crisis. But the people like Ryan Gosling and Brad Pitt are so good looking that it just, and, and, and celebrity filled, you know, it just reminds me of uh, every hedge fund trader I've ever met. They all look exactly like Ryan Gosling. I assure you, um, I'm being sarcastic. They do not. But my point, but there was something going on in the movie that I, I was thinking about in the context of where we are right now. And that was the ability to use your marks to sort of delay an actual reaction. You can never delay inevitable forever. But the reality was, is that in the movie, the whole premise was that their uh, value of these swaps that they had bought on credit default swaps on the mortgage bonds, that they, the, the, the subprime market was falling apart. And so they bought this insurance that should have been going up through the roof and it wasn't moving because the people yeah. controlled the pricing. And I don't think that can go on forever either. And I don't think manipulating pricing is an investment strategy. And then anyone listening knows I don't think that and you guys certainly know it. But I do think that when you don't have to look at the mark every second, um, if no one knew the market was down today, um, would we even have to be doing an emergency podcast, special edition podcast, if people only got a mark on the Dow every month or every quarter? I don't think we would. Yeah, I think so absolutely not. I think that uh, if you know, it's, and and 
to me, I kind of relate this to the price of people's homes. How the price of your home, I mean, if you're actually trying to buy and sell it uh, every second throughout the day, the, you know, the, the price is going to change a little bit if you actually knew what people are willing to pay for your home at that particular second in time. But because you don't, you don't see how the price of your home changes, and it, it seems very, very stable, and you don't worry about the fluctuation of uh, your, you know, the price of your home. Conversely, the stock market, things work exa the exact opposite. The, the price is always being, uh, uh, you know, marketed as far as there's buying and selling. It's always happening that everybody's privy and all that information is public and instantaneous. And so, the, you know, the, the, the changing of the price, when it actually should be more transparent, uh, encourages the wrong type of behavior because you're focused not necessarily on the value of uh, the certain investment, but you're focused on the price, which is uh, kind of an ethereal thing of what people are willing to buy and sell at that specific moment in time, and it may be pretty divorced from the value of the investment. So I guess, Joy, in the, the theme about illiquidity being a, a, a self-fulfilling prophecy of benefit to a client portfolio because the investor psychology is eased, and of course the asset classes themselves are, are less correlated to direct uh, equity prices, but um, is there is there sort of an experience? Is there a teaching out of what we're dealing with now that reinforces that? Yeah, I mean, I I guess that's why you know um, people who are not in in that industry want, who don't invest uh, for a job on a you know do that as a on a daily basis need need us and hold their hands because when you it's kind of scary to see the volatility in the in the markets, but you don't want to focus on price but on value, and mm -hmm. when you look at the value. And then you feel comfortable with the uh, the companies you own. It might be volatile; they might change prices uh, all day with five percent moves, but the value is there. And you know, now you, last week you had headlines about the S and P being at nineteen times earnings, which is the highest level since two thousand two. But mm -hmm. you know, what people forget to to say is that in two thousand two, the ten year yield was at five percent. And now well, we don't forget to say that. Well, some commentators on CNBC, yeah, we right. don't, but right. which means that the the premium, you know, the premium you're paying to own equities is um, is much lower now. Yeah. So it's actually much more attractive buying the S and P or buying equities at uh, 19 times speed today than it was in 2002. So you cannot compare really with that on a, comparing on a relatively. Yeah. relatively I, I, I would basis. push back on that though. I agree with you, except for I don't think you can't compare. I just think you have to acknowledge that there is some distortion of comparison. I still think that a asset classes have to be measured absolutely and relatively. And I agree that 19 times when the tenure is at four and a half, oh, excuse me, at one and a half versus 18 when it's at four and a half, that, that you have to combine both factors. But I still think that there is a sense in which, on a standalone basis, because as many people have said to me, and they're not wrong about this, you act as if my only choice is between buying a bond and a stock. And they do have other choices. They could buy neither, mm -hmm. yeah. right? They could, you, you know, in theory, they could buy something and take a 0% return and allow inflation taxes to erode a little bit or things like that. But I think, I think that, that your point is that we, it not uh, contradictory to the idea that stocks as an index, especially with the technology weighting therein, this is what's very interesting. The S&P X tech, its multiple compared to S&P X tech historically is below average. That's how much of the S&P's weighting, uh, S&P's valuation is being brought up by excessively overpriced technology. Wow. Mm -hmm. And so if you're willing to view the stock market as a whole bunch of companies in financials and materials and industrials and consumer, yes, energy, although that's a very small weighting these days, but my point being all these other things, X tech, it's not that expensive. It, 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 no. and so I, so uh, you're say, saying on a relative basis and an absolute basis, there are a lot of pockets of the equity market that are pretty... Inexpensive. There's only one I think is deep value. Deep, meaning above 20% sure, sure. disconnected from fair market valuation. That would be energy. And then I think there's a bunch that are kind of fairly valued. Only one, and maybe I would include consumer discretionary, mm. um, not to the same degree of technology that are, I would consider excessively overvalued. But of course, that excessive overvaluation has a reason. Yeah. 
But it's true that uh, in um, you know just a few weeks ago, the well, I think there was two thirds of the S and P performance was due to four stocks that were like the four yeah. obvious suspects yeah. in the you know in the tech sector. Yeah. But now when you look at our core dividend growers, um, the the multiple is much lower than the, than the market. We are like around yeah. 13, 14 times PE and f- twice the the yield. Yeah. And I guess that's why you feel comfortable owning. Uh, and you know days like today, you you glad you own them. Mm-hmm. Well, I'm going to close this out with another one of the highlights from from Buffett's interview. And, you know, I quote Buffett from time to time. There's a lot of stuff he says I I fervently disagree with sometimes in the political realm or whatnot. And I don't know how directly hands-on he is anymore with the affairs of Berkshire Hathaway. They have a lot of very smart people there. And and Buffett's been a very successful investor over the years. But but he has certain nuggets and principles of investing that we would be very— foolish to ignore and he made a comment today and he's made it a gazillion times in the last 50 years it's something that we've talked about the bonson group when we look at our small cap approach when we look at our emerging markets approach when we look at our private equity approach and especially when we look at our dividend growth equity approach and that is i do not consider myself an investor in the stock market i consider myself an owner of companies and i would just ask everyone as we're dealing with coronavirus, the companies could have some impact. What's going on? They could have some supply chain disruptions. They could have their customer base interrupted. They could lose access to certain geographical markets. It could last a week. It could last a quarter. Uh, they could have, you know, God forbid, be customers or employees that actually face the health scare themselves. There's exposure, and we don't know the outcome, and we will not make a decision um, that could do significant damage to client portfolio when we don't know. And so we have to sit here and analyze this thing the way we always do from a risk-reward standpoint. But when you look at the stock market moving down a significant amount in a day, you know, 2 3%, 4%, that is a classic case of price being disconnected from value. And yet, if you don't view yourself as invested in the stocks, if you view yourself as an owner of the businesses, I really don't think there's anything to even think about. Um, now, back to that joke earlier as someone needing to – make the down payment on their house with their stock market account tomorrow. Yeah, that would that was probably not very good planning. Um, and, and we are really adamant about people not having short-term savings aspirations and things that are connected to volatile risk asset prices. But whether it's private credit or stocks, and by the way, whether it's a 10-year treasury bond, every single investment you ever have a chance to make is right now priced on what people expect about its future cash flow generation. That's what an investment is. And we do not believe that anything we own on behalf of our clients has had its long-term cash flow generation impacted. Therefore, to the extent that the present sentiment and news cycle and, and, and whatnot has brought prices down, we have increased, we have increased the expected return for long-term investors. It's something to think about, something to understand mathematically and economically, but emotionally to the extent that there are things that still just sort of feel a little uncertain, feel a little disconcerting. Don't hesitate to reach out. We want to be that uh, ear for you and more importantly, a voice of reason uh, because you will not find the voice of reason, I don't think, on the television or the internet right now, especially not the internet. What an awful place. <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, let's go back to work, guys. Anything else? Anybody have anything else you want to close with? That was, that was, those are great closing. Thanks, for, thanks yeah. for listening to the Dividend Cafe. We look forward to coming back to you later in the week.